are here today to change the conversation. And changing the conversation requires that we take a look at things in a different way. And my segment is about women and leadership. And since this is a TEDx, the intention is to make it local and relevant. So how do we change the conversation about women and leadership in Belize? Well, let me start out by telling you that no Belizean woman who is a leader ever set out to be a leader. That's the first thing. Nobody as a little girl, not even me, with my bombshell self, ever said, you know, when I grow up, I want to be a leader. What happens is that circumstance, hard work, determination, make you a leader. For some women, this has come in the form of family. I think of women like Miss Jane Usher. I think of women like Madame Liz, Gwendolyn Lizaraga, our first female minister. For some women, it is about need. I think of women who are like Nanny of the Maroons, who became a woman of circumstance. I think of women like the Black Star nurses in Belize who saw a need and filled it. Then there are the women who respond to an urgency. I think of people like Dorla Bowman. I think of people like Christina Koch, who rise because there is an urgency and a need. And then there are those women who, by fate or circumstance, become elevated into their positions. And among these people, of course, I would classify women like our very own Governor General, the first Governor General of Belize, Dame Minita Gordon. I think of women like Madame Justice Michelle Arana, the first puny, female puny judge in Belize. And I think of women like myself, who has had the opportunity to knock off a couple firsts myself. But it wasn't that any of us ever set out to be leaders or to think deeply about leadership. But for all that, for all the fact that there have been many, many firsts, and we could go on naming them, in Belize, there is still the idea that the norm of leadership is male. Leadership in Belize has a default setting that is male. And that is something that is accepted not just by men, but by women who support the notion that men are better leaders, more natural leaders, leaders who people will follow, and that women who lead are either outliers, exceptional exceptions, or freaks of nature, <laughs> and sometimes not in a nice way either. And this is the narrative that we have grown up with, and that unless you challenge that status quo and step out beyond your comfort zone, you don't become a leader. Why is this so? I'll give you one word, culture. Just so ego. That is our culture. It is a truism that came out of a cliche that culture is probably the most difficult thing upon which to effect change. We just saw the video with Sherry Sandberg, and we see how culture shapes the way that women are treated and how people behave towards women in leadership positions. But in a small country like Belize, can we afford the cost that culture and the non-participation of women because of that culture has put on us? Let me give you a for example. For example, Cuba is five times the size of Belize with about 50 times the people. And a long time ago, Cuba made up its mind that women had to be full partners in the development of their nation. And they have actively pushed very hard to ensure that women step up to leadership roles. In Belize, we have not. And I believe that this has hampered our development. But like somebody said before, that's a topic for another TED Talk. 
No small country, however, can afford economically, socially, politically to miss out on half of the talent pool that it possesses, particularly a country like Belize that is so scarce in human resources. And therefore, notwithstanding that we have had women in political office, Belize, I am sorry to tell you, ranks absolutely dead last in our hemisphere in the matter of representation of women in political office. We're so badly off that when you look at the world standings, we are below Islamic countries and virtually in the bottom 10 percentile of all countries in the world in terms of female political participation. And granted, that is just one measure, but it is a measure that is important. And why is this? My thesis is that it has to do with our culture. In the late 1980s, I was a militant feminist, determined by whatever means possible to wrest power from the hot, sticky hands of the men who were oppressing all of us bright young women who were determined to make a difference in our nation. Today, I'm happy to tell you that I am a militant feminist determined to persuade men that it is in their interest to give up some of that power and share it with women. But more importantly, that it is in the interest of women to take up that power and to exercise it. Because until and unless we do that, we will not change the conversation. We will not make any change in our society. Some time ago, I wrote an article. It was called Force Right Baby. And I was pretty shocked at the reception that it got. That people were connecting with it and saying, yes, you're talking about something that I have lived with and lived through. So what was it about? It wasn't written to provide solutions. It was written as pure provocation. It was written as an unmasking. It was written as a mirror so we could look at it and see ourselves. Because I am truly convinced that we don't see ourselves anymore because it has become so commonplace. And what am I talking about? I'm talking about a culture of violence against women in our society that is pervasive. At 12, I suddenly sprouted a young woman's body. And all of a sudden, I didn't know what to do with this new shape that I had. When I was 11, I was maga as a guava limb, as my friend corrected me this morning. I thought it was Tambra, and he said, no, the guava limb. I was maga, and I used to run around everywhere. But with the new body I had, I stopped running. I started rounding my shoulders inward. I started to act in a way so as to hide the breasts that I had developed and stop running around because it just simply attracted too much attention. And it was attention that I did not know simply what to do with. All of a sudden, at 12 years old, I started facing the suspicion of my mother's friends who would mutter things about this Lee Force right girl. And they made it sound somehow as if I had purposely done this, as if I had taken myself and wrapped myself in some brown paper along with a banana for ripen. <laughs> and they looked at me with deep suspicion as if somehow I was going to take something away from them. And if that wasn't bad enough, I also faced the attention of my father's friends who all of a sudden started saying, I, darling, can give to you a hug and one kiss. And then would, you know, hands up all over me. And it was something that I had a long time to think about it and think about how I felt about it. 
because I was convinced that that was normal. When I think back, that was abuse. I wasn't hurt, but I was abused. I was abused by adults who simply could not leave my innocence alone because my body had decided that this was the shape that it would take. And it didn't get any better, you know. It got worse. I used to walk home or walk to and from school when I was going to school at St. Catherine's, which had a primary school back in the day, in my little white school uniform, walking to standard four, standard five, standard six, and then in high school. And I would get all this attention from men in the street, men who would demand that I look at them, that I smile at them, that I acknowledge them. And it was a shameful situation where somehow I felt that there was something I had done to attract all this attention. But when you think about it, when you really think about it, this is something that almost every schoolgirl in Belize faces. It wasn't that I was hurt, but I was abused. And I became an angry, angry young woman with a sharp, vicious tongue because it was all the defense that I had. It was the only way I knew how to defend myself. So why start there? I start there because I had this conversation with a friend, a woman and a mentor who is a friend. And we were talking about the 14-year-old girl who had been found in Chetamal, who was raped, beaten, left nude, dumped on the streets. And I was relating to her, you know, this thing about growing up. And she looked at me and she said, what? You gone through that? Now, I must explain that my friend has grown up in a rural setting, Kofi Odasek village. And she was genuinely shocked that somebody who was obviously middle class, had educated parents, would actually go through this. And she said to me, the village we talk about, the 100 pound test. One of my friends told me today that in the city it's the 98 pound test because that's what a bag of flour used to weigh. What is the 100 pound test? The 100 pound test is where you weigh 100 pounds as a female child and you're then fair game. Or put another way, once your foot could touch the ground when you use the toilet, you're good to go. And this is how, I am told, men would evaluate your readiness for sexual activity. And it was the banality, the acceptance that this should be so, the male attention that is not just sexual in nature, but the corollary female acceptance that this should, be, this should be so, that goes along with it. That struck me most viscerally. And while we were talking about this 14-year-old, several questions came up. Where were her parents? Where she made it today? Maybe she had too much to drink. Whose fault it was? And here it was that we weren't having a discussion about how a 14-year-old had had her innocence violated, her life stolen away. We weren't talking about what it resources she would need to recover. It was a conversation about why she was in the situation that she was in. And it started to take a really ugly turn that was almost accusatory of this child. And it comes right back down to what we do when we are faced in these situations as a people. What do we do? What do we say? Do we even care? Do we want to do anything? Do we see what is happening? Or do we simply accept that this is how it is? Are we unfeeling? Are we paralyzed? Or is it something that is far more insidious? And this is the point to which I come, that it is our culture. 
that somehow we accept that women are to be quiescent flesh, that are to be consumed by men on whatever terms that are dictated, and that that is a dark side of our nature that we don't seem ever to want to confront. I know it sounds like angry feminist talk, and it is but it also happens to be true. And if we have any courage, we have to face that. We have reports in the media about men having sex with minors without ever stopping to think that legally you can't have sex with a minor. Having sex is a, is a consensual construct. It isn't a violation of your personhood. Nothing much changes, and that narrative continues. And what is even worse is that when you comment on it on Facebook, then all of a sudden you get these things about how, oh, the girl on Lee had crutch. She was looking for that anyway. And she wanted money and gifts and blah, 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 blah. And you want to know the worst part? It's the women who are saying that, not the men. Men say it too, but it is the women who are saying that. And she's accused of being immoral, of being full stripe, of being reckless, careless, stupid. And it is standard commentary. It is virulent. It is heat seeking. It is lacerating. Same like Monica Lewinsky said you cut somebody to pieces with your words and you make a judgment on them based on a few snippets of conversation. And the truth is that in Belize, both men and women watch young girls like hawks riding the thermals. The women with suspicion and anger. And let's face it, more than a tinge of jealousy. The men watch them avidly as if they are seeing prey. Now, don't get me wrong, I know I'm speaking in stereotypes. I know this is not everybody. But I do think it is a fair generalization to say that young girls in Belize are treated like prey. And it is seen as both natural and inevitable that the predator will get a fair chance at the prey. We need to question that. We need to question why that is so. We need to question why we have the saying that you lock up for you cow, I no defense my bull. As if the cow was of much less value than the bull. But we still have households in Belize where the boys get a bigger share of whatever food is available than the girls do. Girls and women too often in Belize are reduced to the worth of their flesh. If women are flesh and only mere flesh, so many women and girls end up in violent and abusive relationships because that is the sum of their worth to their partners. And you end up in situations where women are being denigrated, they're being told that they're worthless, they're being beaten unmercifully, they're being raped, they're being isolated, they're being kept economically vulnerable, held hostage, held their children held hostage, and imprisoned them in their own homes, where women are shot and killed, and there is impunity for most of these acts. And all of this occurs because on one level or another, these women refuse to cooperate with their abusers. It's not about sex. I need you to understand this very clearly. It is not about sex. It is about power. It is about who has the power, who wields the power, and who has to accept that power being exercised on them. It is about having to dominate and its corollary, having 
to submit. And in Belize, female submission is expected to the point that if you are not a submissive female, you are seen as a threat, a troublemaker, and a bembe woman. Few Belizean women willingly accept those labels and comfortably live with them. It is because I happen to be a proud inheritor of the title Bembe Women that I, along with some other female attorneys, co-wrote the Domestic Violence Act in 1988, wrote the Sexual Offenses Act, wrote the Sexual Harassment Act, which as far as I know, nobody has used yet, wrote and supported the formation, wrote the legislation, the enabling legislation, and, and supported the formation of the Belize Family Court, insisted that Belize sign something called the Belém do Pará Convention in 1996 on all forms of violence and discrimination against women. And yet, all of that failed, completely and utterly failed to stop the culture of violence against women in Belize. For all of my advocacy, for all of the advocacy of women like Dorla Bowman, Women Against Violence, the efforts of people like Dolores Paldo Ramos Garcia, we fail to change the culture of violence. I fast forward two decades later. In April of this year, Colleen Sharp was found in her home, shot, battered, killed by her husband who committed suicide. A couple of weeks later, two women, Juana Cardenas Cowo, and I'm gonna get her name right because she deserves it, Keisha Buller, were both found dead in their homes at the hands of domestic partners. Marilyn Elizabeth Herrera Mejia was found in her home dead and her child was missing. So many other Belizean women have been murdered. Most of them, we don't even remember their names unless they happen to be friend, sister, family member. And what about those who are driven to kill? Those who endure abusive partners only ending up in a situation where they kill the partners. And I'm not just talking about women like Nora Param, who a lot of Belizeans know. I'm also talking about women like Crusita Godfrey, who is not as well known, and of course, Kieran Zib, who most of us have read about in the media. What help did they get? Who knew that they were being abused and turned away saying, this is a man a woman business, I no one get involved. What resources were available to them, physical or mental, to be able to overcome the abuse so that it didn't have to reach a situation of fatality? And let me tell you, this is not uncommon. I've had over the 25 plus years of <laughs> legal practice, don't do the math as somebody said earlier, I've had over 25 years of watching women being isolated having their possessions taken away from them, being refused to work, having to beg for simple things like sanitary napkins, having to knuckle under because somebody says they have to be home at a certain time, having to physically go to the homes of some of these women to help them to leave, only to have them return for one reason or another. And it's not about judgment. But a lot of the time, you know that these women are going right back into a situation of domestic violence. And when I see these women, I feel like such a failure. I feel like nothing I have done in my life has made any difference. And if that wasn't bad enough, one woman who is here today and who I deeply respect said to me, you know, this thing are really in crisis. In her own small community of Dangriga, she knew 
within a seven week span, eight or nine women who had been abused at home by their partners. You and I, no victims. The question is, what do we do about it? Can we change this culture that we find ourselves in, this, this culture of abuse? The real question is, do we want to change the culture? Or are we more interested in the juicy art of Yeriso and Shush? Are we more interested in the blood sport of what Monica Lewinsky refers to as slut shaming? This is something that has always existed. We've just now had a name for it. Shaming women for being women, for being sexual beings. It takes a bad situation, like a 13-year-old being procured by her brother and forced to be raped by her cousin for us to even get angry about the abuse that occurs to girls. And what is even worse in that scenario is that it is reported that the parents don't want any case. Luckily, in that situation, the state has the right to step forward. But I think we have to recognize that, that we are the evil because we are allowing this to happen. And until we change the conversation and start to challenge this culture that treats women as flesh to be consumed, as objects only measured in the worth of what we are to some other individual, largely male, nothing will change. Men will still be the default option in our society when it comes to power. And leadership will remain firmly in the hands of men. Because if you don't have a worth, no one will permit you to step up as a leader. And leadership comes with the agreement and the acquiescence of the society. Think about that for a minute. People don't step up and become leaders because they are leaders. They step up and become leaders because you treat them as leaders. And that is the change. That is the seismic shift that has to occur in Belize, that has to undergo a fundamental shift for us to be seen as anything more other than forthright babies. And we will remain vulnerable, no matter our numbers in school, no matter our numbers in the workforce. We will remain vulnerable to a power dynamic until we are no longer seen as simply commodities for consumption. Words have meanings. Words have power. Stop telling me I have balls. Stop telling me I have bigger balls than XYZ who is a man. I don't need balls. I woman up. Stop telling men, boy, they act like a pussy. Stop telling men you're weak like a woman. Stop telling men that you gossip like a girl. Words have meanings. Stop sending me jokes that say that women are stupid and greedy and facey and crazy and ugly. Stop sending me jokes that say that men are horn dogs and ATMs and stupid and crazy and ugly. It is diminishing who we are as human beings. I am a woman. If I had to choose all over again how to be born, I would be born a woman. Women who try to be men suck miserably at the endeavor. And most men wouldn't have the intestinal fortitude 
to be a woman. But more than that, it's about being neither a man or a woman. It's about being a human being. It is about being imperfect, flawed, and glorious in that imperfectly flawed creature that we are. It is about seeing the humanity in each other, the dignity, the worth. That is what the preamble to our constitution says. That we have inalienable rights granted to us by our creator and that we have our right above all to human dignity. Because until and unless we accept that, no amount of conversation is going to change anything at all today. Stop, think, change. Easy to say, hard to do. Thank you.